This documentary will cover the American filibuster William Walker and his conquest of Nicaragua. The filibusters were a group of private citizens who raised armies and invaded Latin America during the mid-19th century. They had the goal of establishing new pro-slavery Anglo-Saxon countries in the region. They believed that it was their God-given right through manifest destiny to conquer Latin America and subjugate the local population. Many of them wished to follow in the footsteps of Texas. They hoped that after establishing their independent country, they could lobby the U.S. and be admitted as a new state. Furthermore, they hoped that, as in the Mexican-American War, the U.S. would support their cause and lend them direct military aid. William Walker was a private attorney who lived in the United States. In 1853, without the consent of the U.S. government, he raised a private army and invaded Mexico. He was able to briefly establish two independent countries, but ultimately, he was driven out and forced to return to the United States. I've already done a video detailing Will William Walker's invasion of Mexico and the battles that followed. You don't have to watch that video to understand this documentary, but if you would like to, the link is here to watch. 1855, the U.S. was having serious political strife and streaming towards civil war. Further to the south, Nicaragua was having its own serious political turmoil. The strife centered around the two major political parties in Nicaragua at the time, the Liberals and the Legitimists. When the Legitimists took power in 1854, the Legitimists began executing and exiling members of the Liberal Party. Many of the Legitimists fled the country during this turmoil. However, despite not being physically present, their hearts still resided in Nicaragua. The Liberals returned from exile in 1855, intent on waging war against the Legitimists and retaking power for themselves. They raised support from the native populace and then proceeded to gather a small army. Many of the Liberals believed that they could not obtain victory without foreign aid. In pursuit of this goal, they engaged in negotiations with the American filibuster, William Walker. Personally, I find this decision to be pretty baffling. Walker was famous for being a filibuster. This meant he believed in white superiority and had desire to conquer Latin American countries. And it's not as though he was some extremely skilled general. Walker, aside from his debacle in Mexico, had no military experience or knowledge. The only thing on his resume was his invasion into Mexico. He had two minor victories against a handful of militia before his entire army either deserted or was killed, and then he was forced to run back to the United States for his own safety. Regardless, the liberals pegged Walker as their man and invited him to Costa Rica. Now, it is worth noting that some liberals, including the commander-in-chief of their army, were strongly opposed to Walker's intervention, but their defense dissent was silenced by the liberal elite. After negotiating with the liberals, they compounded their blunder. They offered Walker the command of soldiers and signed a deal stating that any American who made it to Nicaragua would be given a land grant and citizenship upon merely expressing the desire to do so. This meant that Walker could now invite any number of Americans to join his army or to settle in Nicaragua. Though they did not know it, they were essentially offering Walker their country on a silver platter. All Walker needed to do now was win the Civil War. This is Grim Battaglia, and you're watching my documentary on the American filibuster wars and the conquest of Nicaragua. On May 4th, 1855, Walker answered the call from the Nicaraguans. Him and 58 of his followers departed San Francisco and sailed to El Regalo. His army comprised mostly of veterans from the Mexican-American War, soldiers who had joined him in his invasion of Mexico, and veterans of a Cuban filibuster campaign. On June 16th, they arrived. Their first mission would be to take control over Del Transit, also known as the Transit Route. The transit route was one of the most strategically important locations, not just in Nicaragua, but in the entire Americas. Before the construction of the Panama Canal, the route served as the most convenient way to cross between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Ships from the Atlantic could sail down the San Juan River, which would take them almost completely across Nicaragua and to the Pacific Ocean. The river ended just before reaching Lake Nicaragua, and from the river's end, 
goods and men could be hurried by train to the lake. And from there, they could sail into the Pacific Ocean. Control of the route was particularly important for William Walker, since it would give him the ability to have a constant flow of reinforcements from the west to join his army. His first mission would be to conquer the town of Rivas. The town of Rivas was important because it controlled access to this important trade route. The liberal command ordered that Walker's forces be organized as a separate independent arm of, of his forces. This arm would be known as the American Phalanx. Trinidad Moroz, the commander-in-chief of the Liberal Army, saw the great danger this presented. He advocated that Walker's troops be broken up and dispersed throughout different regiments of the Liberal Army, but their leaders rejected this. It's interesting to note that for centuries when the Romans conquered people, they would have the subjected people serve in their armies. They were always sure to separate their men into different legions rather than letting them serve as one independent force. When this practice fell to the wayside in the 4th century, it spelled disaster for the Roman army and was one of the reasons for the West's collapse. General Morose was adamant in his view that the failure to separate Walker's troops would spell disaster for the entire country of Nicaragua. He was so adamant in his view that he traveled to the town of Rivas and alerted the locals of the planned incoming attack, thus betraying this liberal -ist army. This gave the defenders time to rally their troops reinforcements and prepare defense. Due to General Morose's betrayal, the defending legitimists knew exactly when and where the attack was coming from. They prepared barricades and defenses across the western side of their city to help slow the incoming attack. Walker's strategy was simple. He aimed to march straight into the plaza of the town and seize it. In Latin America, the plaza often served center of power and authority since governmental and religious buildings surrounded it. Well, thanks to the defenses that the legitimists had prepared, they were able to slow the attack by Walker's army. They fought bitterly, and over the course of many hours, the attackers were able to slowly push the defenders out of their entrenched positions. Slowly, the defenders gave ground to the advancing army. They continued to fight as they moved back towards the city square. The attackers, move, the attackers moved forward, continuing to press their advantage to try and push the defenders completely out of the city. The two armies fought block by block, but as the battle raged on, eventually Walker's men seemed to gain the advantage and the defenders were forced back into the town square. Several of the defenders routed in victory seemed to be nearly at hand for Walker and his army. Beaten back and surrounded, the legitimist defenders prepared to put on a valiant last stand. However, just when things seemed to be at their bleakest, fresh reinforcements arrived from Granada. The fresh troops moved through the city and quickly surrounded Walker and his men. Walker, being an inexperienced general, had left his entire left flank exposed and his Nicaraguan allies were quickly surrounded and pushed back by the fresh legitimist reinforcements. Walker's Nicaraguan allies quickly succumbed to the pressure and began a full retreat. They would retreat not just from the battle, but all the way to Costa Rica, where they would withdraw from the war and ask for asylum from the, from the Costa Rican government. Walker and his men, meanwhile, continued the battle. They fell back and barricaded themselves inside local adobe homes within the town. The defenders quickly changed their position and moved onto the offensive. They moved through the city and surrounded Walker and his men and began attacking them, trying to oust them from their positions. The adobe homes within the town were quite formidable. They were made of thick brick walls, had small windows, and made for a strong defensive position for Walker and his men. From within them, they were to put up a fierce defense, and they held out for many hours battling the legitimist army. Walker's men fought valiantly, and when one house became breached, the forces would move back to another fresh home and continue fighting from their defensive strongholds. The legitimists eventually became exhausted and knew that the battle could not continue like this. They consulted and came up with a fresh new plan. They realized that the adobe homes had roofs that were extremely flammable, 
and they theorized that if they set the roofs on fire, the roofs would cave in and burn Walker and his men out, forcing them from their defensive positions. Soon, they put their plan into action and burned the roofs of these homes. Their plan would prove to be successful, and Walker and his men would be forced to retreat from the battle. Walker, in his first real battle, had proved to be a disastrous commander. He had no real strategy, had done no reconnaissance, and apparently had no idea of the size or location of his opposition, and he abandoned many of his men during his retreat to a vengeful enemy. However, despite this, he was able to retreat with much of his reputation still intact. Ironically, Walker's retreat proved to be a victory for his army. He seized control of the transit route by attacking San De Sur and La Virgen during his retreat. He faced no resistance in Juan De Sur and only fought a minor skirmish before capturing La Virgen. With these victories, he opened the route for reinforcements from the Pacific coast. On October 3rd, Walker was greeted by hundreds of new and reinforcements from California. Him and his men seized control of a private steamship and planned to launch a new audacious attack on the legitimate forces. Walker planned to attack the legitimate capital of Granada and to end the war with one swift move. Unbeknownst to Walker, the legitimate forces had, that should have been defending the city had departed to meet another separate liberal army in battle. And the small garrison that should have been defending the route to Granada had left their post when they went to go aid in the defense of the town of Rivas. Walker sailed up the Nicaraguan coast and marched straight into Granada. He marched into the city, facing little resistance. He captured the plaza and took control of the city. In his victory, he took many high-level legitimists as hostages and sent word to the legitimist commander-in-chief demanding that he surrender. The commander of the Legitimus hesitated, and so Walker executed the Minister of Affairs to prove that he was serious. Shortly thereafter, the commander of the Legitimus, General Corral, officially surrendered. With this, Walker and the Liberals were able to claim victory in the Civil War. A new government was founded, with Patricio Rico as the President and Walker serving as Commander-in-Chief. It did not take long for Walker to seize absolute control of the new Nicaraguan government. The cons legitimate forces had agreed to surrender all their weapons, and this left Walker to control of the only army remaining in Nicaragua. Walker ensured that the new government had many special provisions in its constitution, one being that all Americans could come to Nicaragua and settle as they so desired. This would allow Walker to flood the country with American filibusters and create a new Anglo-Saxon elite class. Walker then granted control of the transit route to a close American ally. By 1856, his force had swelled to an army of more than 2,000 mercenaries and was increasing in size every day. With his puppet president in place and full control over the Nicaraguan army, Walker's victory may have seemed absolute, but it would not go unchallenged for long. Unbeknownst to him, a large counter movement was brewing all over Central America. And by the next year, Walker would find himself at war with nearly every country in the region. This war would comprise of battles involving tens of thousands rather than mere hundreds. These wars would serve to unify the peoples of Central America and ignite a great wave of nationalism amongst their people. Eventually, Walker would even find himself fighting American mercenaries who had come to oppose his rule. Join me in my next video to see the conclusion to William Walker's campaigns in Latin America. We'll cover the battles that took place and provide more in-depth battle analysis for the battles fought in this second portion of the war. This was Grim Battaglia, and this was my documentary on William Walker and the conquest of Nicaragua. Please comment, like, and subscribe. If you have any comments or suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching, and please, never stop learning.